five vast lakes carved by vanished glaciers now hold 21% of all surface fresh water on Earth, more than the immense Amazon, Nile, and Yangtze combined. This is not chance or climate, but the outcome of relentless ice, buried bedrock, and ancient geological constraints. Why did this colossal supply gather in one improbable basin? And why does it remain intact millennia after the end of the last ice age? The real story begins with what lies beneath. A chain of five lakes stretching nearly 1,300 kilometers from west to east contains about one-fifth of all the fresh water found on the surface of the planet. This is not a minor statistical quirk. The combined volume of the Great Lakes, roughly 22,700 cubic kilometers, would submerge the entire lower 48 United States under almost three meters of water. Only Lake Baikal in Siberia rivals this system for sheer volume. And even then, the Great Lakes together hold more surface fresh water than any other single region on Earth. To understand how such an improbable concentration of water exists here, it helps to look back in time. Around 21,000 years ago, the Laurentide Ice Sheet reached its maximum extent, covering nearly all of what is now Canada and the northern United States. This was not a thin blanket of snow. The ice was up to three kilometers thick in places, pressing down on the land with a weight that reshaped entire landscapes. Geological Survey of Canada maps traced the ice margin as it advanced and retreated, showing how the ice repeatedly swept across the region in cycles lasting tens of thousands of years. Each glaciation acted as a sculptor, grinding and deepening pre-existing lowlands. The ice did not simply fill valleys. It carved enormous basins, stripping away hundreds of meters of rock in places. These processes far outpaced anything rivers could achieve. While a river might erode a few millimeters or centimeters of rock each century, a moving ice sheet could remove tens or even hundreds of meters over a comparable span. The result was a set of oversized voids, basins so deep and wide that when the ice finally melted, they could hold volumes of water unmatched anywhere else on the planet. The last major retreat of the Laurentide Ice Sheet began about 14,000 years ago and was largely complete by 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. As the ice pulled back, meltwater rushed into the new basins and the outlines of the modern Great Lakes began to take shape. These were not accidental puddles left behind by a receding glacier. They were the inevitable outcome of repeated over-excavation by ice, locked in place by the timing and scale of the last ice age. The magnitude of the Great Lakes is not a recent development, nor is it the result of climate alone. It is a structural feature of North America's geological history recorded in the bathymetry and the scars left on the bedrock beneath the water. The lakes are not filled valleys. They are over excavated voids left by ice and their presence endures because nothing since has been able to remove them. Glacial ice is not a gentle sculptor. As the Laurentide ice sheet advanced, it drove powerful lobes of ice across the region, each one acting like a conveyor belt armed with rock and debris. The process was relentless, and the ice did more than abrade surfaces. Subglacial quarrying fractured blocks of bedrock, while abrasion ground surfaces smooth 
and left striations and polished cliffs that still line the Great Lakes today. Dr. John Shaw of Queen's University describes these scars as direct evidence of high-velocity ice flow, with drumlins and roche moutonnees dotting the landscape where the ice once surged most forcefully. This pattern repeats across the system, but with striking variation. The rates of erosion under these ice streams far exceeded anything rivers could achieve. Where a river might cut a few millimeters of rock in a century, a streaming ice lobe could remove several meters over the same span. In the deepest parts of the Superior Basin, studies estimate that the ice excavated up to 400 meters of rock, orders of magnitude faster than any fluvial process. NOAA and Glarel bathymetric surveys confirm this. Superior's maximum depth reaches 406 meters, a trench that holds more water than all the other Great Lakes combined. Lake Michigan's deepest point lies at 281 meters, while Huron's basin drops to 229 meters. Ontario, though smaller in area, plunges to 244 meters, reflecting the focused, erosive force of ice funneled along the St. Lawrence Corridor. Lake Erie, by contrast, is broad and shallow, its deepest point just 64 meters, because the ice never lingered or thickened long enough to carve a deep trough. The mismatch between surface area and volume across the lakes is the fingerprint of glacial over-excavation. Where the ice was thickest and fastest, the basins became oversized voids. Where it was thinner or passed quickly, only shallow basins remain. Noah and Glurl. Comparative bathymetry panels reveal this clearly. Superior alone accounts for about half of the total Great Lakes volume, with Michigan and Huron together adding another third. Erie, despite its wide expanse, holds just 2% of the water. The geometry of each lake is a direct record of the mechanical power of ice, not the slow work of rivers or the shape of ancient valleys. These are not filled depressions, but over-deepened basins, landforms that could only have been carved by the persistent, heavy hand of glacial ice. Water in the Great Lakes did not simply gather in the deepest hollows left by the ice. It stayed because the land itself set hard limits on how much could escape. Along the southern edge of the system, the Niagara Escarpment rises, a ridge of Silurian dolostone that forms a natural wall. This bedrock barrier stretches hundreds of kilometers, curving from Wisconsin through Ontario and New York, and it is responsible for the famous drop at Niagara Falls. The escarpment acts as a threshold, holding Lake Erie more than 100 meters above Lake Ontario. It erodes slowly at only a fraction of a meter each century. Other sills and thresholds repeat this pattern throughout the system. The St. Mary's River, which carries water from Lake Superior into Lake Huron, is controlled by a resistant shale and carbonate bedrock sill at Sault Ste. Marie. Here, the outlet sits 230 meters higher than Superior's deepest point. Even with the full force of post-glacial meltwater, the river could not cut a deep channel through this hard rock. The same is true at the St. Clair and Detroit rivers, where narrow, shallow thresholds limit the flow between Lake Michigan and Lake Huron and Lake Erie. These outlets are all perched well above the basin floors, acting like the rim of an oversized bathtub. At the far eastern end, Lake Ontario's connection to the Atlantic is set by another bedrock sill near the Thousand Islands, carved from ancient Precambrian granite and gneiss. 
This outlet sits more than 170 meters above Ontario's greatest depth. The result is a series of natural dams, each one a product of geology, not chance. The lakes fill to the level set by these thresholds, and only surface water spills over. The deep basins remain sealed, accumulating water far faster than it can ever drain away. The Great Lakes do not simply hold on to water by accident. Their persistence depends on a delicate but powerful balance. Every year, about 180 cubic kilometers of water enter the system through precipitation, snowmelt, and thousands of tributaries. The same amount leaves split almost evenly between evaporation and outflow through the St. Lawrence River. This balance is not a recent phenomenon. Decades of monitoring by the USGS and by NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory show that the lake's water budget has remained remarkably stable over the past century, with annual fluctuations rarely shifting more than a meter or two in level. The sheer size of the basins means that water moves slowly. In Lake Superior, a single drop of water can remain for nearly 200 years before it flows out. Lake Michigan holds its water for about a century, Lake Huron for two decades, Lake Ontario for six years, and Lake Erie for just over two years. These long residence times are a direct result of the deep, over-excavated basins and the narrow, shallow outlets that limit how quickly water can escape. The system acts less like a river and more like a continental reservoir where changes in weather or inflow are buffered over decades, not days. Geological processes continue to shape the landscape, but at a glacial pace. The land beneath the lakes is still rising, rebounding by a few millimeters each year as it recovers from the weight of the vanished ice sheet. Yet this uplift is modest compared to the basin's depth, and it has not created any new escape routes for the water. Sediment cores from the deepest parts of the lakes show less than 100 meters of infill since the glaciers retreated, barely a scratch compared to the hundreds of meters excavated by ice. The result is a system that endures, its vast volume sustained by a hydrologic budget and a geological structure that together make the Great Lakes one of the most stable freshwater reserves on Earth. Today, nearly 40 million people rely on this reservoir, carved by ice and preserved by geology. As global freshwater demand climbs, the Great Lakes stand as proof that nature's legacy is not easily replaced. Their existence is not just history, it is an ongoing margin between abundance and scarcity.